I grew up in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and when I was almost 16, I was diagnosed with HIV. At that point, there wasn't a lot of information available out in the suburbs about AIDS, and my parents pretty much believed that AIDS was a curse from God. It's, it's affecting um, kids my age most. I think it is a virus for our generation because everybody's got this attitude like, it can never happen to me. That's just stuff for IV drug users. I never practice safe sex. I never wore a condom. It's just, I guess, a question of personal responsibility. Didn't think that I had to worry about becoming infected. It was hard finding out when he passed. He had actually died of AIDS. And, and my step, me being positive, diagnosed a month later and pregnant and everything else. Right. My birth mother was an IV drug user who infected herself and passed it on through me at birth. It gets hard, like wondering if you're gonna live another day or if you're gonna die or losing your friends to AIDS and wondering why this disease is so um, mean. HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, teeters on the very edge of life. It is just one of the many invisible microbes on the biological frontier. A world of microscopic parasites that have mastered the strategy of invading living cells. They cannot eat, grow, breathe, or reproduce by themselves. They simply lie suspended between life and non-life, just waiting for a host to come along. Well, viruses are actually a part of nature. They have been finding new avenues of infection and finding new territory to infect since the beginning of history. Influenza wiped out 25 million people in one year. For centuries, polio was a cause of painful crippling and death. When viruses were first viewed under powerful electron microscopes in 1937, they were unlike anything science had ever seen. People used to debate actively about whether viruses were alive or not. What we know about viruses is that they contain all the information that's necessary to code for life. But none of the machinery necessary to reproduce on their own. The cell of any living thing is composed of different parts working together. The main goal is literally to live, to copy genetic code for growth and reproduction, and manufacture the proteins that will make it function as a fully healthy cell. A virus cannot do this. It is not a complete cell. A virus is the most fundamental of microorganisms because it's pure genes. It can't function by itself. It has to utilize another living cell to propagate itself and get infected. And this is a human cell. The virus has to get into the human cell, capture the genetic material of the human cell to come out and replicate itself again. So it isn't a free living form of life. And all it is is a collection of protein and genetic information which is delivered as a kind of package to a cell when that cell becomes infected and the, the end being that the cell becomes a factory for producing more virus. Viral genes are protected by a thin shell surrounded by a membrane studded with proteins.
tiny keys that allow it to unlock the door to the cell. But all viruses are not interested in all cells. Influenza travels in the air and targets cells in the lungs and respiratory tract. While hepatitis attacks the liver by way of contaminated food or drinking water. HIV is transmitted through blood and other body fluids and cripples cells of the immune system. The reason this virus is so confounding is that the mechanism whereby it works is almost a diabolical mechanism. It actually destroys the very part of the body that's supposed to be defending you. Our immune system is designed to recognize foreign bodies and eliminate them. An army of defenders, our white blood cells, battle the enemy. When a virus infects a cell, the helper CD4 T cell finds it and commands its team of B cells to produce antibodies which flag the invader. Killer T cells can then attack. Memory cells keep a record for the next invasion. The CD4 positive T cell is one of the major lymphocytes that's responsible for orchestrating or directing the immune response of the body. It's a very focal cell that's absolutely critical to the body's ability to defend itself against infections. That is the cell that happens to be the specific target of HIV infection. HIV has a limited number of opportunities to enter the body in the first place. And worldwide, unprotected sex is the most common way. Yeah, I was really surprised. I forgot I got a food. And the sex. I found out a girl that I used to date a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, well, she told me, she called me and told me that she had the virus and um, that I should come in and get tested. Mm -hmm. I was just in the hospital today and met a young woman who was in the hospital because she had a gonorrhea infection and it got all infected inside of her. And she just said, oh, well, I can't get HIV. My partner is, you know, faithful to me and I'm faithful to him. And I said, but somebody brought this gonorrhea in. <laughs> so there's something somebody doesn't know. It's the truth. It, it doesn't matter if I suffer one person or a thousand people or the whole United States. It only took one person to give it to me. You need to protect yourself and think about what you're doing before you do it. Because it only takes one second to ruin the rest of your life. Or pass it on to someone else. You got it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I make them throw it away. It's not fun to have. And I wouldn't wish it on upon anybody. <laughs> When Hydea was three years old, she and her foster parents found out that her birth mother had infected her with HIV during pregnancy. Nine years later, Hydea's young body continues to fight the disease. Regardless of how it enters the body, once there, it takes command. HIV targets the helper T cell docks and delivers its nucleic acid through the cell membrane. Then it kidnaps the cell's reproductive machinery for its own use. After the tiny parasites push their way through the membrane in search of victims, a dead cell is left behind. Bit by bit, the immune system begins to crumble making the body defenseless against any other illness, like thrush, that affects the throat. I got an infection earlier this year, and so once a week I go in and um, they knock me out under total anesthesia, and they put a tube down my throat, and on the end of this tube is kind of like a balloon, and they pump up the balloon and stretch open my esophagus. Clinics have sprung up in cities around the country to help teenagers cope with the disease. Good morning, adolescent program. Yes. Oh, would you like to schedule an appointment? Hello. How you doing, Julio? 
Yes. And how old are you? Seventeen. It's been a while now since you've been diagnosed HIV positive. And um, how has it changed for you? Well, I'm feeling pretty, sometimes mm -hmm. depressed. Mm -hmm. You know, like I have a lot of mood swings. Mm -hmm. When are you feeling more depressed? What times do you feel? When I see a commercial on TV, uh -huh. I don't know about, um, if you don't have safe sex, you're gonna die. So how does that make people like me feel? Mm -hmm. You know, like, oh my God, there's nothing left for me to do. I'm just gonna die. Mm -hmm. Great, all right, pulse is strong. <laughs> I'm just gonna feel, see what's happening with you with any lymph nodes. Do you ever find that you have swollen glands? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's part of your body's way of fighting this virus and reacting by... Yeah, no, that's how I first... Is that how you warnings. notice it? Yeah. Really? Mm. When you look at HIV-infected people at different stages of disease, they have variable levels of decreases in this CD4 count. And the level of the CD4 count is a good measure of the level of disease of an individual. For example, the normal CD4 count is somewhere between 600 and 1,200. Since you started taking your medication, your T cells have risen up to over 800 and they've been steady there for a while. And that's a really good sign right now. But we've just had a new test that we're starting to use called a viral load test. And what that does is it measures the actual amount of HIV in your blood. Actually, it's, it's a lot better than a lot of the other tests we've been doing on you because this is actually measuring the virus itself and how much viral burden we're seeing, you know, in your blood. Okay, since we're talking about, um, about the T cells and everything, a lot of kids are asking me what's the difference between HIV and AIDS. I mean, I know how you would explain it to me, but how can I explain it to a teenager who doesn't know the medical terms? Mm -hmm. and when you get the virus, it doesn't mean you have AIDS. AIDS is when your immune system has decreased to the point where you're now vulnerable or at risk for getting the other infections. Every single day, a billion new viruses are produced. And in response, your body basically keeps up with this for a long time by producing a billion new T cells, CD4 cells. But over time, there's a few more viruses, and so the scale starts to tip. That's why people who are HIV infected generally die of other complications because their body's defenses have been completely destroyed. A lot of times it, it stays... This usually well happens true, over a long HIV period of time. I've, I've seen kids really involved with it. I've seen kids doing really well, and something just wipes them out. She's got herpes. Oh, come on. No, seriously. What are herpes, it's Mom? Just like the and I know, you know, that's a possibility. I've had a brain infection. I've had blood. I've had pseudomonas. I've had um, LIP. I think I had pneumonia for a year and all sorts of infections. I can't even remember. It was a lot though. Despite everything, Hydea makes the best of her situation. You just Except deal with it as you go along. I mean, when she gets sick, of course, you know, you panic and everything, but other than that, it's a daily routine. Just go with the flow. Hope for the best. I like to go in the park. Yeah, I know. <laughs> when she was diagnosed, they weren't doing anything for children but treating the problems, the symptoms. They weren't doing anything to try to, um, to get the virus under control. Go, go, go! <laughs> A lot of people were asking, how could I let her be a guinea pig? You know. I'm back. And to me, no matter where I took her, she was a guinea pig because they didn't know anything about AIDS and, and pediatric AIDS at that. So she took Hydea to the National Institutes of Health to participate in what's called a protocol study. They like do new medicines and stuff and they see how you do and if it's doing good for you, then they'll keep you on, but if it doesn't, they take you off. The patient is a 46-year-old male who was diagnosed HIV positive in 1989. It was like the doctors up there was really dedicated to trying to get a hold to the disease, trying to find out how it worked. Well, he's probably going to have a very difficult time, unfortunately, for him. 
A generation ago, no one had even heard of AIDS. We don't really know how HIV first originated or when it first entered the human population. We often think of uh, new viruses as, as being newly created or newly evolved, but in fact most viruses that seem new, most infections that seem new, really come from somewhere else and they found the way to get from one place to another. I if you will, these mechanisms are highways for viral traffic. and so. These viruses are moving as we are along the highway, and as we move, we may take our infections with us. HIV very likely was able to take advantage of this opportunity. There may have been people from time to time who became infected with the virus that was the ancestor of HIV in its natural setting, from probably from contact with another species, maybe a monkey, we're not sure. In recent years, as people increasingly moved into the cities, those who were infected were no longer isolated and disconnected. They were able to take this virus with them, and HIV was poised to reach the rest of the world. In 1981, when we became aware of this very unusual disease, it was pretty obvious that this must be an infectious disease. There's no way it could have been anything else just by the pattern of how it was spreading. So my feelings at that time were that I better get involved in this very intensively because I felt it was going to be a very difficult and long road fighting this epidemic. A new disease known as Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, AIDS, was first identified about 18 months ago and now has public health officials worried. They have found several cases where people who had been sex partners both had the condition. Researchers are now studying blood and other samples from the victims, trying to learn what is causing the disease. So far, they have had no luck. By 1983, the global blood supply had been contaminated. For hemophiliacs who survive on blood products, AIDS became the number one cause of death. The uh, virus was difficult to detect in the blood, su blood supply because there was no diagnostic test available. So around uh, oh, early 80s, 1985, when it was firmly established that the virus was responsible for AIDS, so would you start right here then uh, we developed a diagnostic test that would allow people to screen every unit of blood that was donated to determine whether it was G, infectious or not. G. So we're looking for a sequence of four G's followed by an A, T, C, C. So would you start right here? G, G, then T, then A, mm -hmm. and three C's. We are able to dissect all the parts of the virus from its nucleic acid sequence all the way to the protein components that make up the virus. So we are able to detect a person's immune response. Bingo, we got it. That's the junction. That bacteria is making the protein we want. All right. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, right now, the blood supply is extremely safe because of this test. That same technology, the ELISA test, is used today in clinics and hospitals around the world. It ensures the safety of the blood supply and also serves as an HIV test. I only need one tube of blood, and we'll send it off for the test. This test, what exactly does it test for? I mean, I know it's testing to see if I have HIV, but does it actually look for the virus or? Okay. What the test actually is doing is looking for antibodies to the virus. Mm -hmm. So it's not the virus itself that, that we're picking up at this point, but we will be picking up any antibodies that your body may have made um, mm -hmm. in response to being exposed to this particular virus. The clear plasma on top is where the antibodies are found, and the red blood cells have been packed down to the bottom. And we will then test for the presence of antibodies in the plasma. A couple of people I know at my school have tested positive for HIV antibodies within the past year. And um, it's just really important to me that I would know if I had HIV or AIDS so I could get help and not pass on to someone else. The separated plasma is tested in the lab to determine if there are HIV antibodies present. Yellow means positive. The majority of the kids that we have come in contact with um, has contracted this virus through heterosexual contact. 
Um, most of the females are heterosexual contact. I think the hardest part for me having this disease is being thrown into a category of either a slut or a drug user. When in reality I only had sex one time with one person. It's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. Um, some days are, are better than others. You know, one after the other, the stories begin to sound the same. This is, you know, this has happened to me. I was devastated, and uh, I thought my life was over. I felt like my world fell apart. My future is, I think, at best, very uncertain. Today, AIDS is a leading cause of death among Americans ages 25 to 44. People who die in their 20s may have been infected when they were teenagers. There is no cure. Since it is pure genetic material, the things that interfere with it almost naturally would interfere with the normal part of the host's genetic material. So if you try and knock out important functions of a virus, you walk a very close line of knocking out important functions of the host. HIV is especially difficult to fight because it is a retrovirus. Retroviruses have found different ways to deal with the fact that RNA is not what our cells are used to handling. There's a, an enzyme, a protein in the virus that actually copies over the virus genetic information, the instructions of the virus into a DNA form. So retroviruses essentially disappear into the cell's own working mechanism. Once it infects, if it's able to establish an infection, uh, the virus is in the body for life, essentially, in the DNA form in cells. And curing it means essentially eliminating that genetic information. That's very difficult to do. The greatest weapon against viruses has always been the preventive vaccine. Viruses like chickenpox are made of DNA, which means they rarely make mistakes when reproducing. So if you introduce a dead virus, the vaccine, into the body, the memory cells of the immune system keep a record and know what to do if the real thing shows up. RNA viruses, like HIV, have a kind of mechanical flaw. They are constantly mutating so it's much harder to make a vaccine. We call them smart, uh, but it's smart in an evolutionary way. Uh, it's an interesting concept that fascinates all of us. Scientists have spent a lot of time trying to outmaneuver the virus. Considering how difficult the problem is, the scientific community has made remarkable progress. The kids that we started protocol with uh, seven years ago, six years ago. A lot of them aren't here anymore. You know, so, um, have they come a long ways? Oh, yeah. You see the kids, and they're not as sick as they used to be. You know, they're HIV positive. They're not full-blown AIDS. Patricia is also HIV positive. She and Hydea met in 1992. Every time I went to the hospital, she was there, and I was in the hospital a lot, so I'd always go in her room and I'd always play with her. I asked my mom, does she have a home? And my mom said no. I said, Mom, Mom, will you take Patricia, Patricia? And my mom finally said, yeah. She cheated. Oh, Patricia, when I got her, they told me she probably lived to be 18 months because she was pretty active with the virus at that time. She's four and a half, and she's right up to par with the rest of the four-year-olds. But life isn't completely normal. Much of the day is spent taking medicine. Just ready? This is all my medicine? Ready, set, go. I take mine. Thanks to many different scientists who work to develop treatments like AZT and protease inhibitors, 
Hydea and Patricia's quality of life has been greatly improved. Some researchers engineer molecules and grow them in crystals. Although their machines may look like something out of a science fiction movie, they are serious research tools. The drugs that you take right now are molecules and we feel that we can discover more and improve drugs in the future using this kind of molecular research. 3D imaging allows scientists to visualize how the shape of the drug molecules fit the virus. We're using the information, the three-dimensional information on the screen here to help us think more creatively about the experiments in the lab. AZT stops the virus's code from incorporating into the cell's DNA, preventing the virus from taking over. Yeah, you can sit up there on my bed. Okay. It hit the general market in the late 1980s and has proven helpful in preventing the disease from passing between mother and child during pregnancy. More recently developed, protease inhibitors disable HIV after it leaves the cell by altering the enzyme called protease that activates new viruses. Taken in combination, these drugs provide hope for longer life. But there are side effects, and scientists continue to refine treatments. Considering how difficult the problem is, the scientific community has made remarkable progress. A great deal is understood now. There are a number of drugs for the first time hitting different viral targets, which give the potential of really being able to treat the infection much better than we have been able to do in the past. So what's missing? What's missing is the fact that we have not succeeded in preventing people from catching the virus. Many teenagers still have as their prevention strategy, I can look into his eyes and know. I can tell. But it's not true. I mean, there's no way of knowing who has HIV. You're not invincible. Um, and it's not like a dress. When you get tired of it, you can't take it off. Once you're infected, that's it. That's the ball game. And they do have meds, <clears throat> but it's not a cure. I know it sounds like, why should I? When you're dealing with death and an illness, I, I just don't think five minutes of fun is worth what you'll be paying. I just think people that was infected with the virus is like real skinny and they jaws just like sucked in and can't really do too much and go too many places and stuff like that. But now, I don't know. Ryan Chesley. Jeff Thomas. Kathleen Moore, Douglas Mittenar, Ned Sands, Dan Alkoski, Bob Kearns, Brent Burns, Charlie Ryan, Thomas Rosales, Terry Pickard, Sharon. <laughs> Worldwide, millions of people are infected with HIV. And millions are going to die of AIDS. HIV was once a mystery. But now we understand how it infects. It's a deadly disease, it's a horrible disease, but you have it within your own means to completely avoid getting infected by it. Share the facts and make a difference. National AIDS Hotline, 1-800-342-AIDS.